my grave without a name, that earth may swallow up my shame. Alistair Crowley, the man who called himself the Beast 666, black magician, drug fiend, sex addict, and traitor to the British people. I want none of your faint approval or faint dispraise. To hell with Christianity, rationalism, Buddhism. I want blasphemy, murder, rape, revolution, anything bad or good, but strong. In 1920, Alistair Crowley founded a commune in Sicily to practice the beliefs that he said would one day sweep away Christianity and free men from all restriction and repression. Three years later, Mussolini deported Crowley and his followers from Sicily after reports of human and animal sacrifice and unimaginable sexual depravity caused an international scandal. The British press called Crowley the wickedest man in the world. I have exposed myself to every form of disease, accident and violence. I have driven myself to delight in dirty and disgusting debauches and to devour human excrements and human flesh. I have mastered every mode of my mind and made myself a morality more severe than any other in the world. A thousand years from now, the world will be sitting in the sunset of Crowleyanity. The thing about Crowley was doing everything to absolute excess, pushing yourself to the absolute limit so you know at least where your limits are. So if you're going to do something that's depraved, you do something which is extremely depraved, that even you feel disgusted at, and then try to learn to enjoy it. Alistair Crowley declared the death of Christianity. He was to be the new messiah that would replace the pallid dead Christ. I believe he was the real thing. He had given himself under demonic control. He was evil. Very clever. A genius, for God's sake. A raving genius, you know. In a world of little tiny people, it's Crowley saying, my God, why are you so unhappy? You want to make love? Well, make love for Christ's sake. You want to take drugs? You want to expand your consciousness? Please do it. Since his death in 1947, Crowley has become an icon of rebellion. The Rolling Stones, David Bowie, Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page have all been influenced by his message of freedom. He continues to be a key figure in the occult and is a focus for those engaged in the battle between good and evil. This was a battle that was to play a crucial part in Crowley's childhood. Alistair Crowley was born in 1875 into a wealthy brewing family. It was the height of the Victorian era, and his devoutly religious parents constantly warned him about the dangers of temptation and the terrible consequences of sin. His family were members of the Plymouth Brethren sect. Now, the Plymouth Brethren were radical Protestants. You might even say pathologically anti-pleasure. They believed in the literal truth of the Bible. This included in particular the book of Revelations, which is a constant echo throughout Crowley's imagination, his theology, if you want to call it that. He seems to have been devoted to his father. They used to travel the country together while his father preached in a fairly unorthodox fashion. Alistair was inspired by his father's evangelizing and his earliest ambition was to follow him and become a crusader for Christ. Then something happened that completely shattered his world. Crowley's father died suddenly, leaving Alistair, who was still only a boy of 11, bereft. His sorrow turned to anger. He grew to hate his mother, the church, 
and the pious tutors she employed to school him. Crowley became increasingly rebellious. He set about attacking the thing which had made his childhood such a misery. I had arrived at the conclusion that the Plymouth Brethren were an exceptionally detestable crew. I wanted sin, a supreme spiritual sin, but hadn't the slightest idea how to go about it. He really could not bear his mother. And uh, the first opportunity, when he was a teenager, he had the maid on his mother's bed and uh, obviously felt that this was a kind of revenge. He developed a tremendous state of resentment about his family and all the family background. And so, from the beginning, you see, Crowley sort of had a pretty good kind of background in revolt. Crowley failed to distinguish himself during his school days, apart from getting expelled from Tunbridge after catching gonorrhea from a prostitute. At Cambridge, Crowley finally broke free from the shackles of his upbringing. He published his own poetry, revealing a rapidly developing obsession with sex. When Celia comes, tis earthquake's hour. The bed vibrates like kettle drums. It is a grand display of power when Celia comes. When Celia farts, my hasty nose sniffs up the fragrance of her parts. Shamed are the violets and the rose when Celia farts. Crowley's poetry was so pornographic that he would have been prosecuted for obscenity had he not taken the precaution of publishing it abroad under a false name. Crowley had the natural appetite for sex you might expect from someone in their adolescence. There was something different about Crowley, though, I think. There was almost he was developing a compulsion. Part of that compulsion seemed to be a compulsion towards sin, a form of blasphemy, a form of spitting in the eye of the Christian church. It was at Cambridge that Crowley first became fascinated with magic and the occult. He heard that there were secret societies whose members practiced dark and forbidden rituals. Crowley was intrigued and was desperate to access this hidden world. At the age of 21, a large trust fund freed him from any financial worries. He decided to leave Cambridge to pursue his quest to become a black magician. After two years of searching, he finally found what he was looking for. The Golden Dawn was a secret society dedicated to the study and practice of the occult. Its exclusive upper-class membership included many famous artists and intellectuals of the day. He discovers the Golden Dawn. It's from here on, really, that he feels he's really onto something. This is, this is something brand new, it's fresh. Bram Stoker is involved, um, Yeats is involved, the sort of literary sort of society lot. I mean, he wants to be part of that as well, and he rapidly rises through the magical grades like nobody else has gone through them before. He seems to take to this literally like a fish to water. This seems to be his vocation. For Crowley, who was now referring to himself as the Beast 666, the Golden Dawn turned out to be a bitter disappointment. He thought that they were playing at magic and tried to take the society over. He clashed with the poet W.B. Yeats, who was a prominent member calling him a lank, dishevelled demonologist. This was the real, real major step for Crowley when he thought that he was leaving behind the Golden Dawn and all its sort of milk and water magic and moving into the world of sort of real magic. And he was perfectly willing to take on black magic. He was willing to use any forces that he possibly could, that he could control. Crowley decided to perform the Abra Melon, a black magic ritual that no magician had dared undertake for centuries. Crowley's so dedicated to performing the Abra Melon ritual that he actually goes to the length of seeking out and finding the perfect place and buying a house to do the actual ritual in. Nothing else, just actually to do this ritual. And it's uh, in Loch Ness, Beleskin House. This is such an extreme thing to do. This is not a game. He, I think he's trying to break down, he's trying to push further than anyone else has been before. At the moment, his yardstick is the Golden Dawn, so he's already shattering that completely. 
The Abra melon dates back to the 14th century. The aim of the six-month ritual is to master demons, but it was considered extremely dangerous. If the ritual went wrong, it was believed that evil spirits could be set loose and take possession of the magician. The Abramelin ceremony has an introduction which states that nobody should perform this ceremony. Red rag to a bull with Alistair. Crowley, at a time when he did it, had a lot of determination to delve as deeply as he could into the occult. He certainly did do uh, partially the Abramelin ceremony in the house, which is to do with conjuring up one's guardian angel. Um, but in order to do that, you've got to release a lot of other spirits of one sort or another. Um, even in broad daylight, the room he was working in became almost pitch dark and he had to light candles and this sort of thing to continue what he was, what he was about. Deep mouth from their thrones, deep seated, the choirs of the eons declare the last of the demons, the kingdom is thine to inherit. What I the man actually I don't think mixed a great deal with the locals but they knew what he was about Crowley never made any secrets about the sort of individual that he was and the north of Scotland being the way it is there's, a, there's still some sort of healthy superstitions floating about and yeah I mean there were some people who wouldn't even walk past this place. I have a healthy respect for what the occult can do and, and how it can really muck up your life. Crowley, in his absolutely typical way, he broke off the ritual. He just couldn't be bothered to go on, because it really is pretty exhausting, you know, living on bread and water and, and getting up at three o'clock in the morning with invocations and all kinds of things. It's nothing so much as like being a monk, only harder. And so Crowley gave it up. If you do that kind of thing, you get possessed, in a certain sense. Things get inside you and use you for their purposes. It was at this point that Crowley met Rose Kelly, a young society lady. Courting scandal, he married her the day after they met and took her off to Egypt for their honeymoon, leaving the Abramelin ritual unfinished. The honeymoon was a period of uninterrupted debauchery. Once in the first three weeks or so, Rose took some trifling liberty. I recognized the symptoms and turned her up and spanked her. She henceforth added the qualities of a perfect wife to those of a perfect mistress. When I was in my late teens, Crowley's like an inspiration. He was somebody who was living a life that you wanted to live like. You wanted to be able to do what you wanted. You know, break down the taboos, break down the barriers. And there was somebody that had already done it, so they sort of become your own sort of personal guru. We're at the Great Pyramid now. This is where Crowley and his wife came on their honeymoon. And one night they decide to spend a night inside the king's chamber. This is just for Crowley really to show off and show what a great magician he is to his wife. They must have done this on their own, him and Rose. That's been quite an eerie thing to do. This is it. This is the king's chamber. I wanted my wife to see what a great magician I was. We went accordingly after dinner with candles. I had with me a small notebook in which was written the preliminary invocation of the Goetia. The Goetia is a, a grimoire. 
it's probably the closest thing to a black magic book. It's the lesser key of Solomon. It's got nothing to do with invoking angels. It's got nothing to do with anything particularly spiritual. It's purely to raise demons and nothing else. I invoke thee, the bornless one, thee that hast created the earth and the heavens, thee that hast created the light and the day. This must have been one hell of a honeymoon. Back in Cairo, they were continuing their orgy of hedonistic excess when the black magic ritual in the Great Pyramid had an unexpected result that was to be the turning point in Crowley's life. Rose got into a strange state of mind. I had never seen anything like it before. She kept on repeating dreamily, yet intensely, they are waiting for you. They are waiting for you. When Crowley asked Rose who was waiting, she kept repeating that it was Horus, an Egyptian god. Crowley was puzzled and irritated by his wife's bizarre behavior. She knew nothing of magic and even less of Egyptology. Surely she, of all people, was not receiving a message from the gods. Crowley decided to take Rose down to the Egyptian museum to test what she was saying. Rose had never visited the museum before. To Crowley's amazement, she rushed through rooms full of ancient artifacts until suddenly she stopped dead. There, there he is. It was an image of the same god she claimed to have seen in her vision. Crowley was stunned. What could this mean? Rose told him that they had to go back to the hotel room and wait to find out. There seems to be that instance back in the museum in Cairo when he went to look at this exhibit, which was exhibit 666, and uh, after that getting in touch with somebody that said they were the god Horus. I think at that point, something happened within his life. He opened himself up to a power that never ever left him, which he developed. And I believe he was the real thing. I believe that people that came into contact with him came into contact with that which was supernaturally evil. He had given himself under that demonic control and that demonic control could now affect him and could work through him. I shall find you, I shall have you, I am coming back to you. Crowley was about to receive a revelation that would make him the prophet of a new religion, giving him a charter to pursue a life dedicated to sex and magic, no matter what the consequences. Alistair Crowley had delved deep into black magic, but in all the rituals he had performed, he had failed to communicate with a demonic entity. He believed that this was necessary to become a supreme master of the occult who could harness the powers of darkness. Arum in Cairo, what he had been waiting for all his life was about to happen. Crowley heard an unearthly voice from over his left shoulder. For one hour, at precisely the same time over the next three days, Crowley said that the voice dictated to him the Book of the Law, the work that would become the Bible of his new religion. The Book of the Law, it just really is ripping up everything. It's ripping up the Bible, it's ripping up the Koran, you know, it, it's uh, ripping up all the holy books and saying, we're starting fresh now. This is the word, this is the word of the new eon. We're going to peck out the eyes of Christ on the cross. It's very, very blasphemous. 
It's all about liberation. It's all about having no restrictions at all. You follow your path, you follow your goal in life, and you do that above all else. The Book of the Law is the Bible of the religion Crowley was endeavouring to found. A book of inspired writings, whereby Crowley portrays himself as a medium for some higher force. Inevitably, with an egomaniac like Crowley, he finds himself cast in the central role. The Book of the Law states, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. In other words, people have the right to determine exactly how to live their lives, regardless of moral and religious boundaries. Crowley saw himself as the prophet of this new creed, and a year later showed just how far he was prepared to take it when he set off to conquer one of the world's highest mountains. Crowley had started climbing as a teenager, scaling the perilous chalk cliffs of Beachy Head. In 1905, a year after the Great Revelation in Cairo, Crowley led the first attempt on the world's third highest mountain, Kanchenjunga. But the belief in the absolute supremacy of his will was to have terrible consequences. Crowley was, in point of fact, a very good climber. He could have become known as one of the great climbers. But in this major expedition, the Kanchenjunga expedition, he deserted the rest of the party because they'd had some kind of a quarrel, and the quarrel was largely due to the fact that they didn't like the way that he tried to boss everybody around. And, of course, Crowley simply went off saying, you know, all right, you bastards, if you don't want me, then, you know, that's too bad. The rest of the party was descending the mountain face when an avalanche struck. Crowley was alleged to have ignored the cries of the stricken men, preferring to stay in his tent drinking tea. Four people were killed in the tragedy. Crowley more or less saw what had happened and just let them die. Now, that's uh, sort of really unpleasant because he knew perfectly well, you know, that as a climber, um, it was his job to help them. And, of course, that finished him as far as the climbing world was concerned. From then on, he was untouchable. Unmoved by the tragedy, Crowley set off on a trek across China with his wife Rose and their baby girl. Reaching Vietnam, he abandoned his wife and took up with a mistress back in Shanghai. Rose was unable to cope on her own, and the child died of typhoid. Crowley then deserted Rose for good, blaming her for the death. In despair, she went mad. Back in England, Crowley found his first disciple, Victor Neuberg, a young Cambridge poet. In the case of Neuberg, there was definitely a peculiar kind of homosexual relation, and I'm not just now talking about the ordinary physical thing. Neuberg was in love with him. That's what, that's what I mean. Uh, he got mixed up with Crowley. Crowley saw there a far weaker character, um, plunged on Neuberg, and, of course, got, dragged him into this whole business of black magic. Neuberg was subjected to a series of sadistic acts designed to test the poet's dedication to the beast. The two set off to Algeria to perform Enochian magic, a dark and dangerous set of occult rituals. They walked deep into the Sahara for two days until they reached the point of exhaustion. I think the reason for the desert is it's so desolate, it's so isolated, that there are no, there's nothing for your consciousness to latch onto, there are no markings, there's no change in the desert. And I think this beats your consciousness into a kind of a state of sensory deprivation. I think this is perfect for the sort of magic that Crowley was doing, this is what he wanted to do. And they really were stepping off into the unknown. Disorientated by the effects of the desert and copious quantities of hashish and mescaline, Crowley and Neuberg embarked on the climax of the ritual, summoning Koronzon, the dweller of the abyss, seen within the occult world as the devil himself. This particular ritual was extremely dangerous. There was, make no mistake, they were opening the gates of hell. The, the opening lines are Zazaz, Zazaz, Nasatana, Zazaz. 
And these words are literally to open the gates of hell. He knew, and this sounds a weird thing to say, he knew that magic works. We don't believe in it nowadays, but in point of fact, all that you're really doing is trying to persuade forces that do exist outside this world to come into this world. And to do so, you have to serve as that passage yourself to a large extent. And that's the reason the magician gets inside a circle and stays inside the circle. Now, Crowley liked playing with fire. He drew the circle around Neuburg, and he himself was outside the circle. Well, magicians don't do that. It, it really is dangerous. You know, people can go mad. Um, they, they suddenly hear voices inside their heads that they can't get rid of. Now, um, Crowley, fortunately, was such a bastard that he, he was more or less immune. <laughs> Crowley gets seized with a passion to perform a sexual act and Crowley is the passive partner in the, in the sex act and at the point of orgasm Crowley has like a mystic revelation, he sees a blinding white light, he seems to commune with the secret chiefs and he suddenly realises that sex can be a sacrament, can be in praise of the gods. It's like a short cut, it's a short circuit to go straight in to achieve whatever you want to achieve magically. The effect of the rituals left Neuberg a shattered man. He never fully recovered from the experience. But for Crowley, this was the final piece in the jigsaw. He had now united his belief in the power of sex and magic into one occult vision. Crowley headed off to New York and threw himself into what he now called sex magic. He kept a detailed record of his exploits. I had a Dutch prostitute, a muscular wolf type, with a fine, fat, juicy yoni. She inspired in me a magnificent effort. After the First World War broke out, Crowley offered himself to the British war effort as a spy. Rejected by the intelligence services, he decided that instead he would support the Germans. Crowley began issuing propaganda on behalf of the Germans for German-owned American newspapers. Crowley's defense being that he was deliberately uh, writing such absurd nonsense that it made the German cause look uh, ridiculous to the American people. The best example of this is probably an open letter that Crowley published addressed to Zeppelin. A giant Zeppelin leaves its base for a night raid. See how defenseless this city will lie beneath the gaze of a hawk. The Germans have decided to make the damage as widespread as possible. A great deal of damage was done in Croydon, where my aunt lives. Unfortunately, her house was not hit. Count Zeppelin is respectfully requested to try again. The exact address is Eaton Lodge, Outram Road. Denounced by the British press as a traitor, Crowley decided that it was time to fulfill his role as a prophet of the religion that he now called Thelema. Crowley needed a place to practice Thelema and set off across Europe to find somewhere away from the prying eyes of Edwardian England. He eventually stumbled across a ramshackle farmhouse in Cefalu, northern Sicily. Unprepossessing as it was, this was to be Crowley's temple. What the Book of the Law proposed, the Abbey of Thelema practiced. Crowley must have had in his mind the hope that this was the beginning of his new religion. Crowley set up the Abbey in 1920 with his latest mistress, Leah Herzig, their newborn baby, and a motley band of followers from around the world. Crowley met Leah in New York when she was only 19. She was totally dedicated to him and was prepared to do anything he asked of her. I dedicate myself wholly to the great work. I will work for wickedness. I will kill my heart. I will be shameless before all men. I will freely prostitute my body to all creatures. 
It's amazing to think that, you know, in the 1920s, 80 years ago, Crowley came here with his disciples to sort of found his uh, spiritual college and really just to live a completely different way of life, his own unique way of life. They were going to break through all the constraints uh, that were sort of tying them up in England. Amazing to think that this was here, we, he had his children here and uh, several disciples and several of his mistresses and they all lived under the one roof. The whole point of living here was to completely clear yourself and, uh, and discover your true will and Crowley was the man who could help you do that. The disciples performed sex magic rituals under the influence of hashish, opium and cocaine. They even had a dog called Satan. As far as Crowley was concerned, it was an experiment in a different kind of living. There were piles of drugs on the table, um, the um, children ran around naked and were allowed to sort of come into the room while adults were having sex. Crowley believed that if you gave man absolute freedom to do exactly what he wanted, this could do nothing but good. It was evidently not the most pleasant place to stay. The members were prone to disease, discomforts of various kinds, most of which could only be alleviated by uh, faith in Crowley himself and the ready supply of drugs which uh, Crowley made sure were readily available. Amongst all of this you have to imagine that there was also a family atmosphere, albeit uh, a very dysfunctional one. Uh, um, think Charles Manson rather than the Waltons, I think. When Crowley first arrived here with his followers and set up base camp, um, it absolutely rocked the Chifloo's kind of the whole village um, because they'd never seen someone behave in this way before. They'd never even seen it. He was kind of like a free man. And locally now, I mean, this actual house of Alastair Crowley is supposed to be uh, cursed. And I was advised when I first came here not to go up to the house that uh, it would be you know, a very, very bad thing to do. And so people are genuinely sort of frightened of the actual building. Aaron Paramore first came to Sicily on a kind of occult pilgrimage and was amazed at what he found inside the now derelict abbey. This is the place that Crowley called the Nightmare Room. Disciples were given drugs and made to sit and look at Crowley's pornographic paintings on the walls. The idea was that by doing this, they would lose all their fear and repression. It's a grinning demon. It's a rather well-endowed demon. As people at the Abbey continued to lose their inhibitions, the sex magic rituals Crowley asked them to perform became more and more extreme. Probably the most controversial and lurid episode in the whole Chefalu period is the attempted copulation between uh, one of his scarlet women, Leah Hersig, and a goat. Now, supposedly, at the time of orgasm, the goat was to mount Leah Hersig, and at the time of orgasm, it was to have its throat cut. We can wonder whether what he was trying to do was, A, to test the dedication of his disciples 
to see how far he could push them. Perhaps he also thought it would be a good show. I mean, Crowley was dedicated to novelty, and I dare say that would be a novelty to most people. The goat, the symbol, of course, of Satan. Um, normal man and woman is, is repulsed by this sort of thing, and we wonder what actually can bring human beings to this. And I think what had happened was that in the Abbey, they had sated or satisfied so many of their appetites that all the time they were going just that bit further until eventually they were copulating with animals. Um, and I suppose when you get to that stage, it is uh, symbolic of the depth of evil. Things started to go wrong at the Abbey. Crowley struggled with his growing drug addiction. Leia had a nervous breakdown, but what Crowley called the great work had to go on. People who use the word I are encouraged to cut themselves in order to remind themselves that they don't have an identity. Crowley was there destroying people's egos. That was part of the experiment. He was liberating them from uh, their conventional upbringings. Raoul Loveday was an Oxford graduate who broke away from his middle-class background and came to Sicily with his wife. He wrote to his parents that he was happier at the Abbey than he had ever been. But Loveday fell ill and died after allegedly drinking the blood of a cat sacrificed in a ritual. His wife left Sicily and went straight to the British press. Crowley's little squalid piece of heaven collapsed due to um, one of the earliest tabloid attacks, which rather than attacking Crowley's abbey as being the kind of mind control camp it was, which probably wouldn't have made sense to people at this time, it portrayed this kind of dark, uh, devil-worshipping, uh, orgy-ridden uh, den of human sacrifice, which it, which it wasn't. Eventually, of course, it was Mussolini who... Uh, kicked his little crew out. For many of the people at the Abbey, what they did there blighted the rest of their lives. Deserted by Crowley, Leia Herzig sank into prostitution. Other disciples went mad. One committed suicide. The dream was over. Crowley was now public enemy number one, the wickedest man in the world. Crowley's attempt to start a new religion in the Abbey of Thelema had gone disastrously wrong. His reputation as the wickedest man in the world was sealed. The last years of the great beast's life were spent living from hand to mouth. His fortune was long gone and his disciples had deserted him. He moved from one set of temporary lodgings to another and finally ended up in a boarding house in Hastings. His life of excess had left him with nothing but chronic heroin addiction and infamy. Jeff Lou's come and gone, and there's almost like an irony to it that he's come here really where old people die. The, the great beast 666, the wickedest man in the world, is now residing in a boarding house, you know, with a lot of other old people. He's been through absolute hell and back, you know, he's danced with the devil and he's come back again. And uh, is he a wise old man or is he a a sad, lonely heroin addict in a room. In 1934, Crowley began a libel case against a writer who described him as a black magician. He was desperate for money and believed he might be awarded damages. Examples of Crowley's pornographic poetry were read out in court, and then the wife of Rao Loveday, the young man who died in the Abbey of Thulema, gave evidence of Crowley's depravity. The judge was appalled, saying that in 40 years of justice, he had never heard of such wickedness. Crowley lost the case and ended up bankrupt. But even after such a humiliating defeat, his extraordinary magnetism was undiminished. After a, a court case that Crowley loses, a young woman called Deidre McKellum comes up to him and says, I want to have your child, basically. And Crowley agrees, and they go off together, and they perform a ritual to have a magical son. Uh, a sort of a magical heir for Crowley. And they perform various rituals and they do have this son and his name is Alastair Atatürk. Well, after he, he took me in his arms on the doorstep, 
that beastly lodging which had lace curtains in the window. I don't know where it was now. He, he said, I want you and I want your child. Well, I wanted a child. And I just started from then. And then he came round and saw me off. And he had to give up drugs, pretty well give up drugs for six months, six weeks, um, three months. Because he couldn't, he, he couldn't conceive very easily. Well, I suppose I conceived, he did the other thing, but... <laughs> <laughs> that was the only child who, in the everyday concept, I think he really loved, whom he wanted to see have a future. It wasn't until the end of his life that I really think he came into contact with the kind of love most men would have wanted. Perhaps for the first time, Crowley was beginning to question what his life had really amounted to. Have I ever done anything of value? Or am I a mere trifler, existing by a series of shifts of one kind or another, a wastrel, a coward, a man of straw? I can find no answer whatsoever, the obvious verdict being guilty every time. From an early age, Crowley had been obsessed with sex. He came to believe that it was the key to magical fulfillment. So when he wrote in his diary, weak erection, he knew that the end was near. There was no tears pouring down A.C.'s face whatsoever. We talked the whole day before, and the whole the next day that he died until he went into a coma, which he did very quietly. And then the day after when he did die, there was this strange thing that happened again with the curtains. Very still day, and the curtains blew out across the room and there was a great peal of thunder which as I think the gods greeting him as I am in a thousand ways. I have been chosen by the gods to bring to earth the basic word in which mankind will work for the next 2,000 years or so. I assure you, the world is ready for this move. The great beast died in 1947. And for a decade, it seemed all his ideas had died with him. But then his do-what-thou-wilt philosophy found a new home with a generation that was experimenting with free love, drugs, and alternative beliefs. Crowley had pushed the same boundaries 40 years earlier. He was now a 60s icon. John Lennon acknowledged him as a personal hero by putting him on the front cover of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album. Drugs guru Timothy Leary went tripping in Crowley's footsteps. It's a great trip. And the Rolling Stones were drawn to him by the underground filmmaker Kenneth Anger. The Stones found Kenneth Anger, who in turn introduced them to the world of Alistair Crowley, which at least for a time seemed, uh, heaven sense probably the wrong word, but uh, certainly seemed to uh, suit the direction they were heading, which was unquestionably infernal. The Stones' flirtation with the dark side was brief, but since the 60s, the occult has seen an explosion in popularity. There are now thousands of occult websites on the internet, with many dedicated to the great beast. For devotees of Crowley, it's possible to certainly see a lot of the things he predicted, prophesied, as having come to pass. Certainly Christianity's grip over what we can and can't say, what we can and can't think, what we can and can't do, is diminishing. Today, Crowley's followers believe that he was a true prophet because he foresaw a society that has now embraced ideas of sexual and spiritual freedom. Others are not so sure. I think today modern occultism sees a very watered-down version of Crowley. They gloss over uh, the, some of the atrocious things that he did. 
um, and they just want to see him as a, a benign a humanist, somebody who said, let's be free, let's go with the flow. Um, and it is to deny uh, an awful lot of evilness that happened in his practices. We should be open and honest uh, about Alistair Crowley. Crowley may have done some extreme things in his life, but was he truly evil? Does he really deserve his reputation as the wickedest man in the world? Crowley never called himself the wickedest man in the world. From a fairly early age, Crowley wanted to see himself as the great B666, um, simply because he wanted to see himself um, as somebody who'd broken free absolutely completely from Plymouth Brethren and from his mother. Crowley was a victim of his own idea of Christianity. Probably, if Crowley had been born into a modern environment where he didn't have to be a Christian or anything of the sort, I think that uh, half, of the, uh, half of his force would have disappeared because he wouldn't have had anything to brace himself against, to fight against, to hate. Alistair Crowley's life was spent affirming his freedom. It began in defiance of his family, Victorian morality and the Christian church. But the desire to exert his own free will became an obsession and a license to live his life to outrageous extremes. Crowley's beliefs ultimately proved to be as damaging to himself as they were to others. He didn't seem to understand that a philosophy of do exactly what you want doesn't really work for 99% of people. If you took away all laws, all restraints and all the rest of it, his society would suddenly turn into a pretty horrible mess. Crowley's attempts to establish a new religion left him bankrupt, friendless and physically wrecked. But he has left an extraordinary legacy of a life pushed to the absolute limit. Crowley ultimately is as magnetic and exciting as he is repellent. There are aspects of his character which are very difficult to admire or even tolerate. He was childish, he was unpleasant to many of the people who most admired him. But above and beyond that, Crowley was and is mythic. And there are aspects of this myth which are very, very positive. I find it difficult not to stand in awe of his appetite for life, his vigour, his determination to challenge himself and the world around him. Crowley wasn't afraid of anything or anyone. Bury me in a nameless grave. I came from God, the world to save. I brought them wisdom from above, worship and liberty and love. They slew me, so be my grave without a name, that earth may swallow up my shame. Masters of Darkness next Tuesday is on later at 5 past 11. There's a taste of that coming up in a moment. <laughs> <laughs>